OK. All right, so basically, I'm going to be talking about um, resonances in recurrent neural networks. And somehow, there's going to be two sides of this presentation, one uh, mostly centered to machine learning on how can they be used to learn better uh, time series. And another side where I would try to show that the resonances that uh, I, that somehow should work for machine learning can actually be learned by uh, biological, like biologically observed learning rules. Okay, um, now the general, let's say, abstract or philosophical motivation for this is uh, this paradox of intelligence that if you ask, uh, you know, 20 different people uh, what intelligence is, they typically come up with something that is on the ground on the lines of uh, the ability to generalize to basically do well or solve problems in different scenarios uh, as a paper that summarizes uh, different opinions by Legan Hatter um, but this very generalized uh, this generalization idea somehow is at odds with uh, what we know of specialization so in machine learning there's this no free lunch theorems that tell you that when you know to to be good at certain problems you have to be bad at other problems uh, we also observe this in comparative psychology um, and generally um, basically the problem the point that i'm trying to address here is how to uh, solve this whole how to make sense of this uh, in recurrent neural networks okay um so just to begin with i guess so at least some of you are familiar with reservoir computing but uh, well, just I'll give you just a quick uh, introduction. Um, OK, so when you want to train um, neural networks to process time series, you typically need some, some idea of recurrence. Basically, you need that the information that the time series sends into the network it stays there for a while. And the natural way to do that, or the initial uh, intuitions for this, was by uh, using recurrent connections. Now, the problem is that training recurrent neural networks is very hard. So two people uh, simultaneously or two labs simultaneously came up with the same idea, which is, well, if training recurrent neural networks is hard, let's just not do that. What they did was to basically create a very large network of neurons with recurrent connections, randomly initialized, and then train only the last layer. So basically mapping the state of the network into the variables that uh, you want to obtain from it in a way that basically shifts the, the weight in, the, in the, the complexity towards the network in the sense that instead of training and spending a lot of resources in training, they just create a large net network, which would obviously require more neurons, but didn't need that much training. Now, in more formal terms, what you have is a dynamical system with many dimensions, like one neuron per dimension. Uh, that evolves according to some equations. Uh, in machine learning, they're typically uh, an hyperbolic tangent. Um, yeah, and then you basically train the last layer uh, by linear regression. So you, I mean, geometrically speaking, what you do is that you calculate the distance between, between a linear combination of the neurons and the output that you want to get, and you try to minimize that distance. Um, yeah, okay. So that's something that obviously works. If there's a, uh, quite a few fields where it's still roughly state of the art. Um, yeah, so um, basically one of the things that uh, happens in this world of reservoir computing is that there's a trend towards uh, creating good reservoirs. That means uh, there's quite a few papers looking for um, different metrics or different way to make sure that the dynamics are rich enough to capture many different properties so that basically they would trying to create reservoirs that would work for across a wide range of tasks. Now, this goes a bit against this notion of specialization in the sense uh, one would expect that to really do well in a particular task, you need to specialize in it. Um, and basically that's what I'm gonna be doing this first part of the presentation. Um, just because this is a machine learning task, there's three uh, examples, so three data sets that I'll be using. The first one is uh, the Mac glass time series, is a chaotic time series, uh, com computer generated, and the task is to predict it. Uh, the second one is also prediction uh, from a time series that's actually empirical, it's from a laser, and although it's uh, generally accepted that this particular system is chaotic, um, it's empirical, so there's some noise, it's, it's not, um, let's say, uh, clean chaos, so to speak. 
Um, and final one is more classical machine learning. It's basically speech recognition. There's spoken digits, and the task is to know which digit was spoken. Um, in that case, I took a very compressed uh, version. So there's a there's a lot of information that been that's been lost. Uh, you can think of it as if there was a high level of noise. Okay. Um, now, the general intuition, like the whole lesson from this part, is um, a very simple notion. That's whenever you have a time series or a signal, it always has a narrow frequency band, or almost always. Like basically, if you see a signal that has all frequencies uh, being represented, then you're probably looking at white Gaussian noise. And what I want to do here is to leverage this by uh, classical ideas from signal processing, namely the fact that whenever you have a signal and it has a particular frequency band, you should uh, basically filter everything but that band. To give a simple example, if you look at an electrocardiogram and you're looking for a particular arrhythmia, uh, arrhythmias have a particular shape. Like there's a certain frequency range in which we know they, they are. Uh, so the, the thought here would be to say, well, if you're looking for arrhythmias, then take your signal, filter it so that you don't have to worry about other frequencies that you know are not related to the particular rhythm you might be looking at. And that's basically all you need to know about signal processing. The second thing is maybe that you can create filters uh, by using feedback loops. It's a classical tool in control theory. Uh, in the signal processing world, this is called infinite impulse response filters. Um, yeah, if you work with them, you'll, you'll basically, uh, that's you know, like a signal processing 101. So basically, that's the thought, to create reservoirs that are tuned to particular frequencies that somehow resonate at a given frequency. Because if we know the frequency of the time series that we're looking at, then we can create hopefully better reservoirs. Now, before I go into the results, I just want to give you a sketch of how does one uh, approach this mathematically. So how do you prove that uh, adapting to a certain frequency is a good idea? And what I want to use here, it's um, uh, basically a sort of geometric uh, intuition of how linear regression works. Basically, when you train for linear regression, what you have is uh, an output time series. That's the target. That's the thing that you want to get as an output during training. And it's a vector, right? I mean, time series is just a set of values. You can write it as a vector and put it into your computer. Um, now, the neurons, they're also vectors in the same way. Like, they're just times. They just have one time series per neuron. And what the linear regression is supposed to do is to basically combine the time series of the neurons, those vectors that the neurons give you, to get a vector that is as close as possible in Euclidean terms to the, ver to the target vector that you want to obtain. Now, if you draw it, that basically means that you have a space where every time is one dimension. So time one, time two, time three. And every neuron is a point in that space. So for every time you get one value uh, per, per neuron. So you have, uh, if you have n neurons, you have n points. And the output is also a point in that space. Now, what you do is that you create a plane that passes through all the neurons and you pick the point that is closest to your target. And this is what the linear regression gives you. Um, now, here's the trick. When you do a Fourier transform, it's just a rotation. So it's just a change of coordinates, but it's an orthonormal one. So distances are preserved. If, you're from a, if you come from a signal processing background, uh, you are probably familiar with, uh, with Parseval's theorem, uh, which states that the energy of the signal in time is the same as in Fourier space. Uh, the energy is basically a distance, it's sum of squares. So that's how you would frame it there. Anyway, the point is that you can go to Fourier space, and then you would have neurons and uh, points, and it's all the same thing. Now, in either case, the way that you would the, the way that you would try to reduce your uh, training error, like basically this distance between the target and the um, and the linear combination of the neurons, is by pushing the neurons toward the target. And this is something that backpropagation through time, for instance, tries to do or should do, basically pushing the neurons towards the target. But there's a problem, at least in the time domain, which is that. If you push neuron three towards the target, then you automatically push neurons one and two somewhere else. Because basically all the neurons are coupled, like whenever one changes, you affect the other. So if you go and you do your derivatives in time and you say, well, I would like neuron one to be stronger at the first input, that means that 
uh, on time on the second time step, neuron two might change, and this will somehow defeat the purpose. Um, so the reason why it's interesting to look at this in the Fourier space, it's because now you can think in terms of resonance. So you can go and say, well, if I know, for instance, that the target is mostly in frequency two, what I can do is to train, to make my neurons resonate at frequency two, and that would automatically shift all the points towards the target, uh, but as an ensemble, not individual neuron by individual neuron. Uh, you can write a bound for this. You can basically uh, go and say, well, my error is a distance between the linear combination and the, out and the target output. And you can split this uh, particular distance in two. So one part, which would be the part that is collinear with the target, uh, and one part that is collinear with, that is orthogonal to the target. And basically, all neurons have those two components. And what you would try to do generally is to say, well, I want my neurons to be very collinear with my target and very and not very orthogonal to my target. Loosely speaking, neurons should only do whatever thing target is doing. In a way, you know, if all your neurons are exactly like your target, then your linear regression uh, works. Um, yeah, then basically the like the somehow mathematical process to do that. It's it's very crude, but it works. Uh, it's basically to say, well, I create a, a readout. I, com I create a linear combination that is a bit worse than linear regression is uh, by basically just assigning a sign and a fixed weight to every neuron. And then you can basically compute a bound that tells you uh, that's the thing that you see in the last line, which loosely speaking tells you that if your uh, neurons are very orthogonal to your target, then your error is going to be large. If they are very collinear, it's going to be very small. And this whole thing is scaled by the output, which is quite natural because if you just multiply the output by something, then the error multiplies with it. OK, so that's just the math. Now, um, that, te that tells you that you should make your neurons resonate to the frequencies that you are interested in. Uh, the question is then, how do you do that? Well. Um, I told you before that a feedback loop is a way to do a filter. And when you have a network, a feedback loop is nothing else than a cycle. So what you see here, for instance, is uh, uh, different networks uh, where I added different amounts of, of uh, cycles. And basically, every plot has the power spectral density. That is how many near, like the average response of the neurons to a certain frequency. And um, yeah, and on the x-axis is frequency. And the blue line is basically the neurons that are uh, random. So that the, it's the standard state-of-the-art reservoir where every connection is random. And yeah, and since it's not tuned to any particular frequency, it reacts to all frequencies in more or less equal measure. Now, if you change some of the connections so that there are many neurons that are connected to themselves with a, with a positive feedback loop, that means that you're somehow averaging the output of the neuron at every time, and that somehow smoothens your signal. That means you create mostly low frequencies, and that's what you see in the green line. So the green line has a, here in the legend says rho equals 0 0.5. That means that half, loosely speaking, half of the connections in that network are dedicated to, or half of the strength of the connections is dedicated to feedback loops of, of length one. Uh, but you're not restricted to length one. You can also work with length two. And the only thing that would change uh, between the green and the pink one is the sign of the, uh, of the cycle. So basically, if you create uh, positive feedback loops, you tend to average. Uh, if you create negative feedback loops of length one, then you tend to emphasize the differences. And basically, by adding cycles of different lengths and by changing the signs, you can emphasize different families of frequencies. Now, I did most of this work in a mathematics institute. So every time I presented this, somebody would come up and say, well, but your networks are nonlinear. So how can you use these notions of filters when the whole thing doesn't is, is not a linear uh, thing? The answer is fairly straightforward. It's basically because even though neurons are nonlinear, um, they are monotonic. So the more you put in, the more you get out. And as long as this maintained, the whole idea of uh, cycles and feedback loops still is valid. Uh, it makes it difficult to create cycles of very long lengths uh, because something is lost in the middle by the saturation of the nonlinearities. But generally speaking, it sort of works. Um, 
Yeah. Okay, so now let's see how this works. Basically, what you see here is uh, the results. Uh, so in every plot, you see on the y-axis the error. So the lower, the better. And on the x-axis, there's this uh, variable, rho L, which measures the strength of the cycles for a given length. Uh, and it can be positive or negative. Basically, if it's negative, the cycles have negative, uh, the, basically the multiplication of the weights of the cycle. So the sign of the feedback is negative. If it's positive, it's positive. Uh, well, the feedback is a positive feedback loop. And then uh, for every uh, row, uh, you have different cycle lengths. And for every column, you have a different task. Now, the, the main lesson or the main thing to notice here is that the standard state-of-the-art reservoir um, has rho equals zero, and that's very often not the optimal choice. In some cases, for some lengths, it is, but it's just not the I mean, you can basically do better. Um, yeah, and one other thing to notice is that basically uh, the, the tasks at hand uh, have different properties. So for instance, the, um, the speech recognition and the Mackie glass time series those are uh, very smooth signals, so they are mostly in the low frequency regime. That means that the, the echo state network, like the reservoir, works better if you make it resonate at low frequencies. The laser intensity time series uh, has, well, I can show you quickly. Yeah, has three frequency peaks or maybe two that have to be em emphasized simultaneously for the, for the reservoir to capture the right thing. Uh, and that is reflected in the fact that the frequencies that, so the right values of rho um, are uh, basically, it doesn't work for cycles of length one because the important uh, frequencies are in the middle. So when you emphasize low frequencies, you kill some of them. And when you emphasize high frequencies, you kill another uh, set of them. But for rho equal two, it works quite well. So if you emphasize frequencies in the middle, uh, that's uh, cycles of length two with negative feedback, it works. And yeah, and basically you also need negative feedback with length three. Uh, that's the general view. You can also create a very simple heuristic that just tries to emphasize the frequencies that you see in the signal. And that gives you the black dotted lines. So basically with a very simple um, matching uh, algorithm that just says, well, I need these frequencies, so I need these sort of reservoirs. Uh, you can get performances that are better than that with any single cycle and definitely better than what you get if you just use random reservoirs. Um, yeah. OK, so that's not super important for uh, the machine learning side of this, but I want to somehow um, present how, some, how the dynamics of the network relate to the eigenvalues of the network. Uh, what you see here is the eigenvalues of a network with cycles of length 3 and positive feedback. Now it looks complicated, and there's like a there's a paper with a very uh, somehow complicated. Well, it's not complicated if you know some very particular branch of uh, statistical physics. But loosely speaking, what is going on here is something that I'll I'll show you in a second. Basically, if you try to create a feedback loop or a infinite impulse response filter with uh, delay three, what you do is something like this. Basically, you put your input, you take your output, and then you send it, you wait three times, and that's it. Now, if you want to do that in a network, what you do is this. And if you want to represent this as a matrix, that would basically be a zero, one, zero, So that's the matrix that represents this network. And if you can calculate the eigenvalues of this, they are e to the 2 pi i divided by 3 uh, times k, where k is 1, 0, or 2. So basically, in, a, in the complex plane, the eigenvalues look like this. And that basically means that inputs repeat themselves every three iterations. 
So if you, I mean, if that's the complex plane, that's the imaginary one, you have, a, have to have a phase of zero, a phase of two pi, and a phase of uh, two pi divided by three, and a phase of four pi divided by three. And what you see here is just uh, what happens when instead of having a single feedback, a single cycle, you have many of them. Again, not super important to get the exact shape and the math and so on, but just the notion that uh, you can get repetitions by eigenvalues and that this is somehow equivalent to resonance, that's the important lesson here. Okay, um, so just to quickly recap, um, there's a very simple tautology that somehow is proven by this geometric argument, which is that the dynamics of the network should represent features that are relevant for your task. It's basically, uh, I mean, that's almost tautological. Um, now, if you're working in time series, one of the natural things to look at in terms of features is uh, the Fourier domain. So basically, which frequencies are emphasized and which are not. Um, and if you want to create a system that will emphasize frequencies, one natural way to look at is at uh, eigenvalues or cyclic structures. I mean, and both are somehow uh, the same thing. Um, yeah, that's something we can maybe discuss with the group and or anyone who's interested that um, I think that this could help uh, if you initialize a neural network with a particular structure, because you know if you have some prior knowledge of uh, what you're looking at, then it's not too hard to create the right cycles for it. So even if you don't believe much into the whole reservoir, uh, because it's actually a very simple, you can still use it for initialization. Um, and naturally, since this group does a lot of uh, things with self-organized uh, recurrent networks, I think that maybe some of these techniques could help understand when or how does uh, SORN work. Um, and also like something that, uh, you know, this basically this Fourier analysis also, if you do it in the right way, it might help you uh, work in hierarchical structures because high frequencies need some sort of uh, more like high level uh, loops. Um, yeah, okay, so that's basically the machine learning part of this. Now, um, if we know that basically we need to make the network resonate at some frequencies, the natural next question is whether um, it's possible to do that by uh, synaptic plasticity. Just so that you get an intuition of how this is possible, so this is just a proof of concept, um, imagine that you have a single neuron connected to itself with delay one and delay two. And you make this neuron fire more or less every two seconds. Now, uh, what's gonna happen is that basically the spike, so the uh, uh, current that goes through the delay, the line with delay one would arrive when, an, when the neuron is idle. Whereas the spike that goes through the, del through the delay line with delay two would arrive at the same time as, the, as another spike is being generated. So if you have a heavy and learning type um, of rule, then what you'll get is that the connection with delay two is emphasized. Now, uh, obviously the brain does, as far as I know, uh, not have these very long delay lines and neurons in the brain do not have these outapses. Um, but the general principle is that these feedback loops can be reinforced by heavy and learning. And in the next steps, we're just gonna somehow uh, show how this can be done. Uh, just before we start uh, to clarify, um, the models that I'm gonna be using for all the simulations are leak integrated and fire neurons. So they get input and they, their member potential goes up. Uh, if you let it idle, basically it decays. And if the member potential crosses a certain threshold, then the neuron spikes. That means it sends current to its uh, neighbors. Um, yeah, and then after some refractory period, it's restarted. Now this is, for the dynamics of neurons as themselves. But in terms of, uh, of for the math, I'm gonna be working in what's called instantaneous rates. Loosely speaking is how many spikes do I expect in a certain time window? Um, this loosely speaking has, a, I mean, if you just put the input, um, what you get is a curve response like this. Basically the more input you have, the more uh, output you get, which is quite natural. Um, so. The model is in, I mean, the model for the mathematics is basically saying that the activity of a neuron at time t, it's a nonlinear function, nonlinear but monotonic, saturated up and down, of the external input plus the output plus the input that the neuron gets from the other neurons multiplied by a certain weight. 
on top of this, I'm going to put some plasticity, which is uh, your standard uh, spike in time dependent plasticity. So basically, if I have two neurons, A and B, that fire, and if neuron, B, if neuron A fires and then B fires, the connection from A to B gets stronger. But if neuron B fires and then A fires, uh, the connection gets weaker. And if the firing is very far apart in time, then nothing happens. Um, now, this is for the simulations. This is on the spike world. But on the, to do the math on the instantaneous uh, rate world, uh, you can actually frame this by what's called uh, differential heavy learning. Basically, you go and say, well, OK, so if systematically, whenever this neuron fires a lot, the other fires a lot, that's heavy learning. So the connection would get stronger. Uh, but if whenever neuron A is, has a certain rate, if neuron B increases its rate, that means that there's going to be more spikes after the activation of A than before. Therefore, it aligns with STDP to say that the activity grows uh, following this notion that this is the product of the activity of neuron A multiplied by the derivative of the activity of neuron B. Uh, you have to integrate it over time and so on, but that's the core concept. Um, these rules have a tendency to become unstable. So if you let things evolve, they would just evolve forever. Um, so what I'm going to add to this is a uh, homeostatic term. Now, there's different ways of, do that, of doing that. You can like change the excitability of the neuron, but uh, to somehow make things uh, clean on a mathematical level, uh, what I will do is to basically put a homeostatic term that's an L2 regularizer on the weights. That means that the weights have a certain decay. So the more a neuron is active, the, more the, weight, uh, the faster the weight decays. Um, and when you put those two, basically those two rate-based uh, learning rules together, what you get is, um, well, a differential heavy learning with homeostasis. You just have one equation that tells you that the weight is going to change, um, partially depending on how strong the weight is. So basically, very strong weights would tend to decay faster. And otherwise, it depends on this factor, which is the activity uh, multiplied by the derivative of the the activity of the presynaptic neuron multiplied by the derivative of the postsynaptic. Uh, you can add a third term here, which would be a heavy learning. That's basically, you can add a term that basically increases when both neurons are active. Um, how much the how much the spike in time dependent versus the heavy learning is strong, that's basically, uh, it's a parameter uh, that you can tune. I mean, basically you can, it just depends on the kernel of the STDP. Um, in the simulations, there's a bit of both. Uh, like basically, the STDP is perfectly symmetric, but for technical reasons, it still has a slight heavy component. Uh, but the approach works in either case. Okay, so now those were just the models. Um, now, what I will put here is a toy model um, where I can show that uh, something like a resonance or something um, emerges that looks like a cycle in some way. And the way that I do that is uh, something that the physicists would be familiar with, which is by putting in a ton of symmetries. So what I would have here is a lot of neurons, all of them getting uh, a periodic input. And just, again, I'm just trying to create resonances out of periodic inputs. Uh, so just like to prove that it works. Um, so I have a periodic input and every neuron gets the same input, but with a different phase. So I would have neurons that would just somehow get a uh, certain input at different times, but all periodic. Uh, I would take this limit where there's a lot of neurons. And um, even though the simulation in the simulations, the network is sparse, uh, there's enough connections so that you can treat this whole thing as if they were uh, as if it was almost fully connected. Uh, but I think the sparsity is uh, it's 10% of the I mean, only 10% of the possible connections are there. OK, um, now, even with this setting where it's very symmetric and very clean, I have one problem when I look at, at my uh, weight equations. That is that I have one equation that tells me how the weight evolves if I know the activity. And I have one equation that tells me what the activity is if I know the weights. If I just have an activity that would change the weights and this would change the activity and this would be complicated. So what I will do is I let the system evolve and when it reaches equilibrium, basically when the homeostatic term compensates the, the differential heavy or the heavy term, then that's the equations I would look at. And 
in a way, what the only thing I'm doing is to taking the previous equation here and setting the delta t, so this change of weight, to zero. And then you get these two very simple equations. Basically, um, the upper equation just gives you, just tells you, well, my neurons have a periodic input, and they're all getting the same input, and they're all somehow connected in a similar way. Therefore, I can represent a single neuron. It's like a mean field uh, approximation, so to speak, which is only represented by a phase. It can be both the temporal phase or the somehow the phase of the neuron uh, with respect to the other neurons. That is variable theta. And because basically it's a periodic input with a bunch of neurons that get the input at different times, you can basically uh, uh, absorb the two time and uh, neuron phase to a single variable. And then that's basically a nonlinear function of the external input, which again, periodic, has a, has a phase. Um, and the sum, or in this case, the integral, because it's just the sum, of the weights of the other neurons um, multiplied by their output. Now, since every neuron is doing exactly the same thing, just with a phase difference, uh, the weights are represented just by the phase difference. I mean, the weights are just a function of the phase difference between neurons. Um, yeah. So, and that's the second equation, basically. The weight between two neurons depends on the difference between their phase. Uh, so if I froze the network, the input that both neuron gets have, has a different phase, and that's what gives me the weight. And this is given by uh, the same thing that you saw before, this differential Hebbian integrated over a period. Now, in, since I'm in this particular space with I only, where I only care about phases, it's not uh, the, the time doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is I integrate over the whole phase. Now, um, the main trick when I look at these equations is that these integrals are actually convolutions. I mean, if you look at the shape, they are exactly the same thing as a convolution. So I'll write this as a, as a couple of convolutional equations, and then we can somehow hope to solve it by using uh, tricks from, well, from single processing or from this Fourier analysis. Um, now, the first thing that I do when I have a nonlinear equation is to assume it's linear. Um, so basically, you linearize around a certain point. Uh, in the particular case of the nonlinearities of the neurons, they have like they have a double saturation. So I would work somehow in the regime where you know where linear still somehow works. And then my equations look like these two things here. Basically, I converted the integrals to convolutions, and I have that x of t. It's some derivative of my function, that's the linearization part, plus the input um, at time t or at phase theta, plus the convolution of uh, those two neurons. And the weight has a similar structure. It's basically just the convolution of the activity of, uh, of a neuron, of the activity of like the representative neuron with its derivative. If you had a heavy term, there would be a second thing to add here, which would be um, a coefficient given by the kernel of the STDP multiplied by um, the convolution of x with itself. But for simplicity, I didn't put it here. Um, and then you just propose an answer, which is that I'm going to assume that my input and my um, uh, neuron activity are sinusoids. And sinusoids has this funny thing that basically the derivative of a sinusoid is another sinusoid. Uh, and this convolution of a sinusoid with another sinusoid is yet another sinusoid. So and they all have the same phase. Um, so what ends up happening here is that when I let my system evolve forever, uh, my weight matrix end up looking like a sinusoid and my activity will look like a sinusoid too. And I can somehow calculate what's the phase of each one, but that's a bit more technical and I'm not, um, yeah. Um, so what you see in this plot is basically uh, what the weight, on the right you see what the weight looks uh, on average before um, uh, before learning and after learning, and it obviously looks like a sinusoid. And on the left one, what you see is how the activity looks. Now, the difference is not big, but that's uh, basically a parameter choice. Like if you emphasize the heavy component, then the activity after learning would be higher than before learning. But the reason I didn't put this somehow heavy component, I mean, besides simplicity, is the fact that when you only have STDP, you see uh, what would be a phase precession in the hippocampus. Basically, the activity after learning 
is shifted forward in time. And I was quite happy with this because it's not something I actively put into the equations in the sense that we're just doing STDP and some self-consistency. And what does come out if you have a very STDP looking kernel is that um, a very like a temporary, a perfectly temporary asymmetric kernel is that you get a slight movement forward. So you get like this phase precession that uh, it's quite relevant for hippocampal um, uh, computing. Okay, so that's one solution. There's another one, which um, is maybe more related to what some people, what we might call like a neural mean fields. Uh, loosely speaking, what you like, um, what you can also work with in convolutional world is with the acts. Those are like basically peaks of activity that just are very narrow and come together. Now, mathematically, that has some infinity, so it's very ugly to define, but you can take what's, what I would call a mollified Dirac, that's a function that basically concentrates off its, all its input in a very narrow peak. And then what you get is something like a scene fire chain. So basically uh, every neuron, I mean, the same plot, like when you look at the weights, what you get is that basically every neuron has very weak weights uh, to other, every other neuron, but very strong weights to the next neurons in line. Um, depends on how you set this thing, you would get basically a double Dirac, but if the weights are too low, then the, mm, there's no negative weight, so that somehow cancels out, but that's basically a parameter choice. Uh, what you see when you look at the activity is that uh, you preserve more or less a similar activation, but you get less noise. So you get less spontaneous uh, firings which goes uh, a bit in, I mean, it's not exactly the same resonance as before. It's not a frequency-like resonance uh, or a, like, or, I mean, or a phase lock uh, thing, but, but you would basically see that the thing that you force your neuron to, your network to have would be repeating itself uh, on its own, even if it doesn't preserve the exact same speed, it preserves the same order. Okay, um, now we'll, I mean, that's just uh, um, a point to make that when you have this matrix, this like uh, very, very like uh, symmetric but shifted matrix, those are called circulant. And there's a very neat trick which allows you to compute the eigenvalues of these matrices. Now, what I show you here are um, no noise, uh, uh, noiseless matrices. So basically you have like a sinusoid matrix and uh, these somehow very Dirac or convoluted matrices. Um, and the eigenvalues are very easy to characterize. You can basically get them analytically uh, if you have the right uh, functions. Um, so what happens, I mean, okay, so some of you may have noticed that uh, in the sinusoid case, there looks like there's only three eigenvalues. Uh, whereas the matrix has like a thousand components. Now that's because all of the eigenvalues are around zero, are basically zero, except the, the two dominant ones. That's again, that's just because there's no noise. If you actually do the simulations and you have uh, some sparsity and some noisy neurons, there's gonna be a cloud of eigenvalues around zero. Uh, but the two dominant modes would be those uh, where the phase is basically given by uh, the particularities of the STP. Um, for the Dirac solution, you get is that the dominant eigenvalues have relatively low frequencies. Uh, that means that you could, in principle, just activate the whole network at the same time and they, and they will basically keep activating itself. Um, yeah, basically, it gives you a bit more flexibility, but yeah. Um, so the eigenvalue trick doesn't, I mean, you have to be very subtle with how you use it, but uh, for, the, um, for the sinusoidal matrices, it works quite well uh, to understand the dynamics, I mean. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so just to somehow give a conclusion to the second part, um, what I have here is uh, a solution for the STDP, uh, which obviously relies on a particular input setting. Um, yeah, and uh, you can, but at least you can somehow estimate what exactly going on in these toy models. Now, the obvious uh, natural thing to do afterwards is to generalize this to more complicated settings. Like for instance, if you have a chaotic time series, you have some sort of pseudo periodicity, meaning uh, if you take, for instance, a Lorentz attractor, it has like some periodic looking dynamics, just that it has two, two cycles and you move from one to another every now and then. 
or you have a Rosler attractor, you have like an existing uh, circular thing and then a peak at some point. Um, now, one of the things that's important to notice and actually the, the idea of somehow spreading the input across different neurons, that's something that actually comes more from sorn like uh, models rather than uh, machine learning ones. Machine learning, most people don't bother too much about pre-processing the input so that different neurons get different inputs at the same time. But in neuroscience, we do. Because uh, if you think, you know, whenever you're walking, um, a classical control theory is trying to make a robot walk. What he, what he or she would do is to basically take the joints of the robot. Those are variables that are very precise um, and very concrete and try to take very few of them. Uh, reduce this parameter space as much as you can until you get three or four equations and then create something that would uh, basically control these uh, variables very tightly so that it does the movement that it's supposed to do. Now, if you're thinking as a biological brain, what you have is a ton of sensors, many of them not very reliable. You know, you have a lot of uh, sensors and a lot of actuators all over your muscles, all over your skin. So what you have is not very few variables that you can control lightly, but a ton of variables that you can control loosely. So what uh, somehow the, the intuition of putting these inputs on different neurons is to say, well, just have a lot of sensors and just have a lot of neurons and just by the phys or by the self consist or the self organization or the self consistency of these equations, uh, your connections would align themselves so that the pattern that you force it to have, it's going to be repeated. Think of it, uh, of what happens when you're learning dancing. At the beginning, you have to think where you have to put your feet and you have to think about everything you do. But after a while, basically you're some part down your uh, motor cortex or the cerebellum or spinal cord figures out that there's certain sequences that always happen in that order. And therefore it uh, locks them. It basically creates a structure that locks this activity, which is based on basically having a lot of neurons as opposed to classical control theory, where you would somehow uh, prescribe a few neurons, a few uh, variables. Anyway, um, yeah. Uh, so just to somehow give a big, like the final, final conclusion this time. Uh, with respect to the paradox that I mentioned before, the like somehow the philosophical solution is to say, well, you do not need to uh, to have near networks that are specialized. You can have networks that learn to specialize. So you expose them to an input that then they figure out what environment they will be, be living in and which uh, particular frequencies are important or not. Um, yeah, um, and just to something, I mean, you know, it's, it's something that we can uh, look forward to, I think, in this SORN or similar models is to, I mean, say the low hanging fruit, in my opinion, would be to uh, use the ecostay network, uh, so the machine learning ideas of enforcing a certain resonance and so on to initialize uh, models that have to learn. So if you have a time series like an electrocardiogram and you know the frequencies that are relevant there, you could just start by making sure that the network dynamics capture the features that you care about and not the features that you don't care about. And this is actually not too hard to do if you think of it from a single processing perspective. Um, obviously the more, uh, probably more like interesting at least learning wise case is um, to use somehow some of the self-consistency equations to analyze how uh, SORN evolves. So basically whether you know, if SORN or similar models are good at preserving order but not phase lock, then uh, that aligns more with the, the Dirac solution of the cell consistency. But if the SORN or similar models basically preserve a phase lock between different modes, then we're looking at uh, something like the sinusoidal solution. Uh, and finally, the thing that I believe would be interesting for the machine learning side of the group uh, is, or, is to think about um, on somehow to provide like a mathematical background for uh, what SORN can and cannot do. In the sense, if you have a particular type of signal with certain frequency and SORN does not pick up that the frequency is important, then, uh, you know, then the hyperparameters of it should be tweaked so that they can pick this up. That's basically the general thought where I think um, this can be useful uh, in this type of models. Um,
yeah, obviously there's a few things that I didn't have time to talk about, but they are fairly, um, I think some of the techniques overlap. Um, basically one can look at uh, an information. I mean, I have developed that trick to use information theory to, um, to basically merge information theory with energy requirements. So if somebody's looking at neuromorphic chips and neuromorphic chips are advantages for energy consumption, then it stands to reason that defining how much code should you have and how uh, complex those codes should be it's a starting point to you know to optimize this um, another thing that somehow comes up within a similar uh, venue as the one that i expose here is to try to look at um, creating sub networks that overlap only in very that don't overlap too much basically there's a way to tweaked uh, the, to create sub-networks reusing the same neurons as long as there's not many synapses reused. And that somehow uh, also overlaps with this, uh, with some of the ideas exposed here. And fin finally, the trick of going to the Fourier domain and working there, if you, I mean, in that particular work, I, wor I, I was looking mostly at the power spectral density. Um, to as a metric of how a network resonates. But if you look instead I mean, in the Fourier space, if instead of looking at the power spectral uh, density, you look at the phases of the activity, then you get another set of uh, tricks that allow you to train del delays in spiking neural networks. Um, okay, so that's pretty much everything I had to say. Um, if you're interested in reading more about this, those are the, the three main papers. Um, the one on machine learning, so this reservoir computing and ecostate networks is the first one. Um, the one on self-organization is the last one. And the randomatic theory one, if somebody uh, happens to have a interest in this, it's, uh, also, it's the one in the middle. With that, uh, I, I would like to thank my uh, supervisor, Sir Jürgen Joost, um, who's somehow the person who, even though he was involved in all the projects, he's the one who somehow sustained me uh, during uh, most of them. Uh, some of my collaborators are Yang Yu and Gang Yang, with whom I worked in the machine learning part, and Tim Rogers and Henrik Schumerus, with whom I did the random matrix theory side. And obviously the people who paid, namely the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics and Sciences, the Max Planck School of Cognition, and the Bundesministerium for Bildung und Forschung. Uh, with that, thank you very much. Um, and I think that's it.